There I am. <clears throat> All right. Join me in prayer, please. Our Lord God, we, we come to you once again this morning. We thank you, praise you, that you are God. Father, that you have providentially seen forth to, Lord, have us in this place at this particular time and this moment in all eternity. Father, may it not be wasted, but Father, may we rejoice in your glory and in your grace. And Father, may we praise you this day. Father, we ask for wisdom as we look at Judge Othniel this morning. And we ask that, uh, Lord, your spirit speak to us as only it can. In Christ's name, amen. All right. <clears throat> a few weeks ago, uh, we, we did an overview of the book of Judges. Uh, we talked about how it was not only a historical book, but it was a book full of symbolism and yet tells the reader an overall story. It has a political satire and is compellingly interesting yet tragic. The book of Judges spans about 400 years and it's about how the Israelites broke covenant with God and disobeyed and uh, God used pagans to discipline them and then he would call upon a judge or a deliverer for his people. If you remember, we looked at a reoccurring uh, cycle of the judges where they would uh, do evil and then the, the uh, nation would be, well, God allowed the nation to be conquered or oppressed. then the people would, would cry out and then God would send a judge or deliverer. We see that this <laughs> thank you for catching that. <laughs> uh, but we would see that this, this cycle would continue, and we see that throughout Judges. And uh, remember the very uh, technical terms, the, the very technical theological terms that we use to, de to describe the book of Judges. Uh, chapters 1 and 2 uh, describes how the children of Israel failed to drive out the inhabitants. They, they failed to drive them out. And then chapters 3, 4, and 5, we see that the uh, first three judges, and here's that technical term, that things were pretty good. <laughs> right? Then 6 through 9... We see a few more judges, and we describe them as being okay. Then 10, 11, and 12, we move from okay to bad. 13 through 16, they get a little worse, and then... 17 and following, they were very worse. <laughs> oh. But we see this, this pattern, and this is the outline that we kind of went through a couple of weeks ago as far as an overview of Judges. And as we look specifically at the Judges them, themselves, we see this same, this same pattern and this same digression within the judges themselves. Today, we're going to take a quick look at Othniel. He's the first of the judges, and he sets the bar or the standard 
for the rest of the judges. If you would, turn in your copy of God's Word to Judges, chapter 3. We'll look at 9 through 14. I apologize about the handout. We didn't have quite enough. We weren't expecting this many this morning. and uh, You're welcome. I mean, it's, it's wonderful to have everyone here. Judges 3, 9 through 14. When the sons of Israel cried to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for the sons of Israel to deliver them. Othniel, son of Canaz, Caleb's younger brother, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he judged Israel. When we went out to war, the Lord gave Cushon Rishthiam, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand, so that he prevailed over Cushon Rishthiam. Then the land had rest for 40 years, and Othniel, the son of Canaz, died. First thing that is seemingly obvious when we read this that we can learn about Othniel is it seems that he is the son of Canaz and brother of Caleb. And back up just a moment. Othniel, if, if you look at your notes there, what his name means. Uh, the definition of Othniel is lion, L-I-O-N, lion of God or time of God. Uh, and as we go through this, we'll see where Othniel fulfills his name of the time of God or the lion of God. But the first thing that we see here is that, that uh, in all appearances, that he seems to be the brother or uh, nephew of Caleb. Now, a third interpretation is that Othniel and Caleb were not blood brothers, but were clan brothers. So turn back a few pages to Judges chapter 1 and verse 13, and we're introduced in Judges here to, to Othniel. See what that says or tells us. Judges 1, uh, let's, let's, start in chapter, or let's start in verse 12, 12 and 13. And Caleb said, the one who attacks Karath Sefer and captures it, I will even give him my daughter, a cat. A, Aksha, for a wife. Othniel, the son of Canez, Caleb's younger brother, captured it, so he gave him his daughter, Aksha, for a wife. Now turn back a few more pages to Joshua 15. Joshua chapter 15. We'll pick up there and read verses 16 and 17. And Caleb said... The one who attacks Karath Sefer and captures it, I will give him Aksha, my daughter, as a wife. Othniel, the son of Kenaz, the brother of Caleb, captured it. So he gave him Aksha, his daughter, as a wife. By reading these two passages, it appears to be pretty simple that Othniel is Caleb's younger brother. But when we take a closer look certain words in, in the scriptures there in those two passages or three passages we see that that uh, Caleb if we go back and we look a little bit into Caleb we can see through Joshua uh, the book of Joshua as well as in Numbers that he is the son of Jephthah the Kenizzite so Kenaz or Kenez was not an actual father, but the name of an Edomite tribe that's talked about back in Genesis. The son of Canaz, therefore, is equivalent to a Canazite. Canaz being a tribe, we must suppose that Othniel and Caleb were really just clansmen that belonged to the same tribe. Yes. Exactly, yes, they were not Israelites. I'm sorry, yeah, yeah. Uh, another thing to support this is the age of Othniel and Caleb and when he was given in marriage and that sort of thing. And, and, and we're not going to dive deep into that right now. Uh, just uh, 
just take from it that Caleb and Othniel were fellow tribesmen or fellow clansmen. Fellow tribesmen or fellow clansmen. Uh, so that means that Othniel indeed did not marry his niece. Now there's some discrepancies there, but I kind of land here. I, I think this, this explains the, the age discrepancy and, and so on and so forth that, that he did indeed did not marry his niece, but that Caleb gave him his daughter. Remembering this circular pattern of Israel, let's look back and see what's going on at the time of Othniel. So we'll pick up in Judges 3 again, and uh, we'll reread a little bit, but we'll back up to verse 7. The sons, or yeah, 3 7 through 14. The sons of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and forgot the Lord their God and served the Baals and Asheroth. Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel so that he sold them into the hands of Cushon Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia. The sons of Israel served Cushon Rishathaim eight years. And the sons of Israel cried to the Lord, and the Lord raised up a deliverer for the sons of Israel to deliver them, Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he judged Israel. When he went out to war, the Lord gave Cushon, Rishtham, king of Mesopotamia, into his hands so that he prevailed over Cushon, Rishtham. Then the land had rest for 40 years, and Othniel, the son of Kenaz, died. This fits right into our biblical pattern here of Israel. It says that uh, Israel fell into worshiping the Baals and the Asher Asheroth. According, according to Canaanite mythology, Baal was the son of El, the chief god, and Asherah, the goddess of the sea. Baal was considered the most powerful of all gods, eclipsing El, who was seen rather weak and ineffective. In various battles, Baal defeated Yam, the god of the sea, and Mot, the god of death, and the underworld. Baal's sisters or uh, consorts were Asherah, a fertility goddess associated with stars, and the goddess of love and war. The Canaanites worshipped Baal as the sun god and as the storm god. He is usually depicted holding a lightning bolt who defeated the enemies and produced crops. They also worshipped him as a fertility god who provided children. Baal worship was rooted in sensuality and involved ritualistic prostitution in the temples. At times, appeasing Baal even required human sacrifices, which were usually the firstborn of the one making the sacrifice. The priest of Baal appealed to their gods in riotous and wild abandonment, which included loud uh, cries and self-inflicting injuries. Now, the Asheroth, or Ascrim, or in plural, Ashkra, which denotes a wooden pole planted or set up beside an altar and venerated as a sacred symbol. It was a characteristic feature of the Canaanite sanctuaries, and from them it was adopted to the Israelites. It seems to have been a general symbol for, symbol for deity, how it came to have this significance is somewhat disputed. Some regard the sacred poles as a substitute for a tree and a relic of primitive tree worship. Others think that the name uh, or, or, or the meaning of that name would be a signpost marking the, uh, the sanctuary or the temple. Here and in a few other passages, Ashcroft, uh, or Ash uh, Teroth uh, is combined with Baal and was served apparently as divinity. Now, after studying this, the, the way that I kind of interpreted it is that there was an altar to Baal that was set up, 
and the Ashtaroth or the poles were set up around this, this altar. And they were typically, as we read and, and know uh, from Scripture, set up in the high places. And God tells them what? Tear down the altar to Baal and the Ashtaroth in the high places. And these were uh, planted poles, uh, I think of a totem pole or something. I'm sure there were carvings and, and, and you know, you, you let your imagination go with what was on those poles and that sort of thing. And they would worship around these poles and it would, uh, for those that couldn't necessarily get all the way to the altar, this was a, a waypoint, if you will. And Exactly. And take all these Asheron, Ash, Asheroth poles down, and yeah, they would leave them in place all over the. Yes. They still had that influence. And then, and then something else to note uh, is that uh, in, in, I think it might not have been in Kings, uh, but in one place when, when God told the children of Israel to tear down the, the altar to Baal and the Asheron poles, he said, and build back an altar to me, and this is my term, in an orderly manner. The scriptures show that contrast that uh, the Baals and Aseron, when they would worship them, I mean, it was chaotic. It was just just screaming and yelling and and self mutilation. And go ahead, brother. Mount Mount Carmel with Elijah. Yes, and so it's it's that kind of scene. And God said, "Whoa, whoa, I'm a, I'm a God of order. No, we will have order, and you will tear these down and build back an altar to me." So it's not just, well, we're tearing down the altar to Baal and building another altar. No, it was in an orderly, specific manner. And we see that with God, that he's telling Israel to do that, and Israel is doing evil. So let's continue. In Judges 3.8, what happens next? The anger of the Lord was, uh, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. So that he sold them into the hands of Cushon Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia. And the sons of Israel served Cushon Rishathaim eight years. So we see here that this is follow, following an order in our cycle and hits the second step of that where God delivered them into the hands of Cushon Rishathaim. Cushon Rishathaim, Rishathaim meaning double evil or double bad. That's on your sheet here. Double evil or double bad. Uh, sounds, like a, sounds like a pretty pretty bad guy, right? I mean, and I don't believe that this was his true name. It was, it was more like what he was called by the people of that time, and the author has this in the text. It was, it was like we would say, you know, uh, Eric the Awful or Stephen the Magnanimous. You know, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> uh, yeah, Ivan the Terrible, or something like. So historically, uh, the, the, this this Cushion was was really a bad guy. He really was, and even so much so that he was noted as being double evil. Oh, now uh, to add to this author's. Uh, Fun, if you will, in verse 8, he refers to Cushon Rishthaim, king of Mesopotamia. Now, when we look up king of Mesopotamia, and that, then we see that in, in some text, it's not translated as king of Mesopotamia, but king of Aram Naharam. So, let's see, did I put that? Yeah, I put it on your sheet there. So, Cushon Rishthaim, king of Aram Naharam. So if you read those together, and I know I butchered it, but if you read them together, it rhymes. So in other words, what is he saying? He, he's saying the uh, Kushan, the double evil king of the double rivers, because uh, 
Asha Naharam is Naharam is the uh, highland of the two ri rivers, uh, the Euphrates sand and the Tigris. So he was the king of the two rivers, or from that region. Yes. So. Oh. Syria, uh, uh, Mesopotamia, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, the 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 uh, king of the double rivers, double evil king, and we see, or I've I've seen this, or seeing this. Uh, let me rephrase. I'm seeing this, and, and keep seeing this throughout the book of Judges here. Uh, how that this author. Uh, puts these things in there. Uh, we, know, we know that all of God's word is inspired, that God doesn't make mistakes. It wouldn't be in here if he didn't want it in here. Uh, but we also can see how he allows the writers, their personalities and, and things like this to come out. And uh, we see that uh, Judges uh, is very, very political. I knew that it was, but wow, after... Studying some more of this, yeah, brother, brother Wayne and I were discussing it this morning, how political Judges is. So let's continue, Judges 3, 9. When the sons of Israel cried to the Lord, and the Lord raised up a deliverer for the sons of Israel to deliver them, Othniel, son of Kenaz, uh, Caleb's younger brother. So we see here the next step in that, which is he raises up a deliverer, a judge. <clears throat> uh, let me back up just a moment because I did. I just missed this step here. Sorry in my notes. But remember, uh, the next step in, in our cycle here is that they cried out to God. So he raised up Kushan, the double evil, and then they cried out. The people of Israel or the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. And remember what we said a couple of weeks ago that... Uh, People often mistake this as repentance. But when we see the cries of repentance in the original text, it is a two-part Hebrew word, cry slash repentance. The second part of that word is missing here in Judges. So we see that they were just crying out. There was no true repentance. Yeah, they were crying out to the Lord, not in repentance, but just in oppression due to their circumstances. Uh, it's kind of like a... a it's kind of like those of us that have children. You know, you, you, you tell your child to take out the trash because they didn't do it the day before, and what do they do? They moan and they cry and they kick the dirt. They take the trash out, you know, and they come out, I'm sorry, I took, uh, you know. Well, it wasn't repentance. They were just moaning because they had to take the trash out. So, so we see Israel here is just they're, just, they're just oppressed and moaning, crying out, oh, woe is us, look how bad it is, we're... We're being persecuted by the double evil one. This takes us up to Judges 3.10. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him, or upon Othniel, and he was their deliverer. So we read that the Spirit of the Lord came upon Othniel, and in numerous places throughout the scriptures throughout the Old Testament we see that the spirit of the Lord or the spirit of Jehovah rested or came upon persons in the Old Testament now when we read this phrase it does not automatically imply election or effectual calling unto salvation it's more like the Lord lends his wisdom and abilities to an individual for his specific purposes. With that being said, I do believe that there are those that the Spirit of the Lord rested upon in the Old Testament that was salvific measures, that they were indeed delivered. We see others that were not. I read, now this is just one commentator's take on this, where in the original text, the phrase used 
for Othniel when the Spirit of the Lord rested upon him that it was interpreted to be that of a salvific nature. So we don't know the heart of Othniel. We don't know the heart of God here as far as if he delivered him or not, but I wouldn't be surprised if we did see Othniel in heaven. It says then he did what? He delivered or he judged Israel. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him and he judged Israel. When it says that he judged Israel, we touched on this a few weeks ago, that it's not in the sense of our English vernacular when we say judge, we think of, a, you know, someone sitting behind a bench. You know, I mean, we won't belabor this, but it was, it was a deliverer. He was a deliverer. And so he delivered Israel. And when he did, Judges 3, 10b, when he went out to war, the Lord gave Cush Ristham, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand so that he prevailed over Cushon Ristham. The first thing to note here is that there's no hesitation. We, we don't see a, a pause there in the scriptures. The Spirit of the Lord came upon Othniel to judge and deliver, and he went to war immediately. The double evil king was then given into his hands, and Othniel prevailed over him. Now, there's not any details given to us of Othniel's strategy. There's no uh, extensive uh, text about, uh, about the battle itself or anything. Uh, we just see that he judged, he delivered. He went out, he went to war, and he defeated him, and it was done. It was done. Othniel just took care of business. Judges 3.11, And the land had rest for 40 years, and Othniel, the son of Kenaz, died. Notice here what the text says. It says that the land had rest. This kind of tells us that it was regional. It was for that particular part of Judah and that it uh, took place, rest did, in the span of 40 years. So they had a generation's rest after being delivered from, Othni from Cushon, the double evil. They, they had a uh, generation of rest, and the land rested. And, and I, I look at that two-part. One is that it, it tells us it's regional, but also that thereby, again, even after the deliverance and during that rest, there was still not the repentance there. So, so the, the people in just one generation, we see that, once again, the cycle starts over. And in a couple of weeks, we'll look at that and how Ehud was raised up as a deliverer. Before we close today, let's, let's take a step back and look at a few things that I believe the author was trying to tell us. Number one, the obvious rebellion and covenant breaking of Israel. We went through the covenants. We looked at the covenant of God uh, with the children of Israel, the Mosaic law all through Deuteronomy and how that if they were to do this, he would bless. If they did not, then they would be cursed. And we see the results of that here the obvious rebellion and, the, and it, how that they were a covenant-breaking people. That pushes us into the need for, pushes them into the need for a deliverer. And with that, we see the love and long-suffering of the Lord. The love and long-suffering of God himself because this cycle continues and continues and continues. And he said, if you break my covenant... This is what's going to happen. And yet, even in their covenant breaking, even in the midst of their sin, God was long-suffering. And he would continually send a deliverer trying to wake them up. We see here the political 
undertones around Othniel. Othniel was from the tribe of Judah, which if you remember was the tribe of David, where King David was from. Othniel was a moral man. He was a man of one wife. Othniel was brave and a conqueror. And as we read the text, we see that he was a natural leader that was favored by God. So, why is this Othniel this so political? If we look ahead in history, as I mentioned a moment ago, we see the similarities between Othniel and King David. If we look at that, that they were both brave conquerors. They were given a wife. They, I mean, all the similarities between Othniel as he delivered the children as a warrior, David, also. And we'll also see in a couple of weeks that the writer of Judges uh, will use the story of Ehud to extend, if you will, an olive branch to the tribe of Benjamin and yet still promote, in the midst of that, the tribe of Judah. Something that uh, that I had not, never picked up on until studying this uh, the past few weeks, and an interesting thing that I found is in the writing structure here. If you look at your notes, uh, I thought it was very interesting how that the author lays this out. We'll look at this just real quick here. I gave myself enough room, did I? Yeah. <laughs> so if we if we look at this, this is called a chiasm. Sorry, I have to. Hmm? They're all through the Bible, yeah. Yeah, I just hadn't seen this. It's, it's really, I, I, I don't know, it may not impress anyone else but me, but I thought it was pretty impressive here. And, and we see it through Judges in other places as well. And Othniel is something else, just an interesting fact. Othniel, being the first judge, being the, the forerunner, the bar was set here. We see the full range of this with Othniel and with no other judge and nowhere else in script in the uh, judges in the book of judges but Othniel and his clan's success we see here is in 1 11 through 20 and the tribe's failure 1 21 through 36 the angel's verdict and prophecy, it's chapter 2, 1 through 5. Passing of the first generation, 2, 6 through 10. The Israelites do evil, 2, 11 through 15. The Lord provides a judge, 2, 16. Israelites do evil. 2. 17. Passing of the judges. 2. 18. 19. God's verdict and prophecy. 2. 20 through 23. The tribe's failure. 3. 1 through 6, 
in Othniel's success, 3, 7 through 11. So with this structure, we see that it's a central, central element is right here, which all points to the Lord provides a judge. The Lord provided a judge. In his long suffering, he sent a deliverer. I want to close out today with a quote from George M. Swab. It's a little long, a little lengthy, but I'll try my best to read through it in a way that, uh, that makes it easy for you. It says, David, if from Judah, of course, and the history of Israel's heroes starts with tribe. All others that follow are in Othniel's shadow and can be compared with him. One thing that comes forth clearly is that the leader should be charismatic. He should have the spirit. The Deuteronomic principle that disobedience leads to punishment and obedience leads to blessing is demonstrated. What is wanted is a leader full of the spirit who can go up against evil and be victorious. We need a covenant-keeping military leader who can deliver us from evil. For Christians, it is not hard to see in Othniel a type of Christ who came in God's timing possessing the spirit without measure, vanquishing sin, Satan, and death itself. And like him, we also wage spiritual warfare, not against flesh and blood, but against the true king of double evil, the prince of the powers of this evil age. And the conflict will continue until the end of the age, the day of the Lord, the time of God, when the saints of faith will be vindicated and the last enemy destroyed. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus, the anointed Son of David. Join me in prayer. Our Father God, we come to you once again this morning. We just give you the praise and the glory. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your love and your long suffering. Father, we thank you that in this text that the key is that you provide a deliverer. You have provided the ultimate deliverer in your son, Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you and we pray that if there be, be one here that does not have that relationship with Christ Jesus, that, is, that has not been delivered from the corruption of sin, Lord, we pray that your spirit would do its work today and, Father, would bring them into the fold. Go with us throughout this morning. Father, be with our dear pastor. Lord, as, as he preaches today, as he brings the word, may our fellowship bring to you in Christ's name. Amen.